Welcome back to this module on dynamic exploitation of instruction level parallelism. After having explained how Tomasulu's algorithm works in the previous lessons, in this lesson I will show how a loop is dynamic schedule, dynamically scheduled. I will not do so by showing all the fields of the reservation stations, the load and store buffers, etc., since this would make the example very long and intricate and so detailed that you might miss the overall picture. Instead, I will show how a loop is scheduled by indicating for every instruction when it is issued, when it is executed, when the memory access takes place, if applicable, and when the result is written to the common data bus. Here's the example that I will use in this lesson. Adding a scalar to all elements of an array X. We have seen this example several times before, so there is no need to explain it in detail. For completeness, but very briefly, it is translated to this MIPS assembly code. First we load XI in register F0, then we add the scalar S to it, then we store the result back to XI, we increment the address contained in register R1, and finally we test if the address is still within the array bounds, and if it is, branch back to the beginning of the for loop. This slide summarizes the hardware assumptions. First, the processor can execute both integer instructions as well as floating point instructions out of order. In the previous lesson I focused on the design of a Tomasulu based floating point unit, but it can be easily extended to all instructions and I will assume so in this lesson. Second, our processor has one integer functional unit which is used for both ALU operations as well as effective address calculations, while I assumed a separate address unit in the previous lesson. Third, there is a separate functional unit to evaluate branch conditions. So branch instructions are not executed on the integer unit. There is also a separate pipeline floating point functional unit and I will assume that the issue phase and the write result phase both take one clock cycle each. In addition, I will assume perfect branch prediction. Branch prediction will be discussed in the next lesson, but in this lesson I assume that the correct target instruction can be issued immediately after the branch instruction. However, the execution of the target instruction cannot start before the branch has completed, since we do not know yet if the instruction should be executed. Finally, I will assume these execution latencies. One clock cycle for an integer ALU instruction, two clock cycles for loads and stores, since they both consist of an execute and a memory access stage, and three clock cycles for a floating point addition. I will now show how our loop is dynamically scheduled. I will do so by indicating for each instruction in which clock cycle it is issued, when it begins execution, when the memory access takes place if applicable, oh, the memory access stage is only applicable to loads and stores, and when the common data bus is written. Furthermore, I will do so for two iterations of the loop. The first column of this table shows the iteration number, the second column the instruction, the third, fourth, fifth and sixth column will indicate when each instruction is issued, executed, accesses memory and writes the common data bus. And the final column will contain a short remark to explain any delays. Ok, let's start with filling out this table. The first instruction is the load. Is issued in clock cycle 1, starts executing, meaning the effective address is calculated in clock cycle 2, accesses memory in clock cycle 3, and writes its result onto the common data bus in clock cycle 4. Since this instruction is the first one that is issued, it incurs no stalls. The second instruction, the add double, is issued in clock cycle 2. However, it cannot start executing until clock cycle 5, since it is dependent on the previous load. Then it executes for three clock cycles in clock cycles 5, 6 and 7, and the result of the instruction is written onto the common data bus in clock cycle 8. So this instruction has to wait for the preceding load. The next instruction, the store double, is issued in clock cycle 4 and starts executing in clock cycle 4. Again, the effective address is calculated in its execution state. However, its memory access stage cannot start until clock cycle 9 since it must wait until the preceding add double has placed its result onto the CDB. The next instruction, the add immediate, is issued in clock cycle 4, starts executing in clock cycle 5. Notice that there is no structural hazard with the preceding add double because they are executed on different functional units. 
Furthermore, the add immediate writes its result onto the common data bus in the next clock cycle, clock cycle 6. The next instruction is the branch not equal. It is issued in clock cycle 5, but it cannot execute until clock cycle 7 because it has to wait for the preceding add immediate to complete. Now consider the first instruction of the second iteration. We assume perfect branch prediction, so this load is issued in the clock cycle immediately after the clock cycle in which the branch is issued in clock cycle 6. However, we also assume that the predicted instruction is not actually executed until the branch completes. For that reason, it starts executing in clock cycle 8. If the effective address is, is calculated in clock cycle 8, the memory access should take place in clock cycle 9. However, the store from the previous iteration already accesses memory in clock cycle 9. I did not say so explicitly, but our processor has a single memory port. Therefore, the memory access of this load takes place in clock cycle 10 and the CDB is written in clock cycle 11. So this load is stalled twice, once waiting for the branch to complete and once because of a structural hazard with the store from the previous iteration. The following instruction is the add double from the second iteration. It is issued in clock cycle 7 and similarly to the load from the first iteration, it has to wait until the preceding load has, to, has written its result onto the common data bus. So it executes in clock cycle 12, 13 and 14 and writes its result in clock cycle 15. The next instruction is the store double from the second iteration. It issues in clock cycle 8, starts executing in clock cycle 9, but its memory access has to wait until the previous add double has completed. So its memory access takes place in clock cycle 16. Next is again the add immediate. It issues in clock cycle 9, executes in clock cycle 10 and writes the CDB in clock cycle 11. So again it incurs no stalls. And finally we have the branch that completes the second iteration of the loop. Similar to the first branch, it issues in clock cycle 10 but it cannot execute in clock cycle 11 because it has to wait for the previous add immediate to become uh, to complete. Therefore it executes in clock cycle 12. This table shows how the loop is dynamically executed. It can be seen that some instructions execute and complete out of order. For example, the add immediate from the second iteration executes and completes before the preceding add double. Completing such a table is a typical, typical assignment in the final test of my course. Therefore, you should also be able to do so and I will give a sample assignment at the end of this lesson. Let us now calculate the cycles per instructions CPI achieved by this dynamic execution example. As can be seen from the table, the instruction that completes last is the store double from the second iteration. It completes in clock cycle 16. So 10 instructions complete in 16 cycles and the CPI is 1.6. If you schedule more than two iterations, however, we will see that one store completes every seven cycles. The store from the first iteration completes in clock cycle 9, the store from the second iteration clock cycle 16, as highlighted in red, and the store from the third iteration will complete in clock cycle 23, and so on. So five instructions complete every seven cycles and the CPI will approach 1.4. For comparison, the same loop but unscheduled on the static pipeline that does not perform out-of-order execution achieved a CPI of 2.0, as shown several lessons ago. The dynamic execution provides a speedup of 2.1, 2 divided by 1.4, which equals 1.43. Not a bad improvement. Finally, an exercise to test yourself. The exercise is very similar to the example that I presented in this lesson. Consider the code shown here that loads xi and xi plus 1, multiplies them and stores the result back to xi and then continues with the, next, with the previous element xi minus 1. This code is executed on a dynamically scheduled core with the same properties as in this lesson. One integer functional unit, a separate functional unit to evaluate branch condition, a separate floating point functional unit, issue and write result are assumed to take one clock cycle each, perfect branch prediction but no execution of predicted instructions 
and the execution latencies listed in this table. The exercise is to schedule two iterations of this loop and show how the loop is scheduled by completing the table on the next slide. And here's the table. For your convenience, the first instruction has already been scheduled, but this one is easy since it is the first one issued. Good luck with this exercise. As said before, it's a typical test exercise and you should be able to do it. This completes this lesson. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, I will describe how dynamic branch prediction works. Hope to see you back.